there are so many good people out there, whether you have a direct tie to somebody dealing with ALS or you're the patient. That's been just so encouraging. People want to support this and they want to see people living their best life, even under the terrible circumstances of it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Connecting ALS. I am your host, Jeremy Holden. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimates that 53 million people serve as caregivers for someone close to them every year, a data point certainly familiar to folks living with ALS. And while caregivers often talk about the positive aspects of being able to provide care for someone they love, caregiving also takes a toll. 68% of respondents to an ALS focus survey said they spend more than 30 hours a week providing care. When asked to list their major concerns, 44% of respondents cited depression, 56% cited the lack of time to engage in self-care, and 35% cited decreased participation in hobbies. Which leads to the question of what more we can be doing in support of family caregivers. We may have answers to that important question soon. In September, HHS released a national strategy to support family caregivers. The report details actions that the federal government intends to pursue in order to support family caregivers in the coming years. The ALS Association's public policy team is reviewing that strategy, and we will be talking much more about that in the coming weeks and months. But in the meantime, November is National Family Caregivers Month. This year, the Caregiver Action Network is focusing on the campaign theme, Caregiving Happens, reflecting the reality that for the millions of family caregivers across the country, caregiving needs don't always arise on a predictable schedule. They can arise unexpectedly. They just happen. Or as the Caregiver Action Network put it, caregiving happens when you're grocery shopping or in a meeting. Caregiving happens when you're trying to get out the door to go to work and it happens when you least expect it. To help us kick off National Family Caregivers Month here on Connecting ALS, I'm joined this week by Christina Woody. We introduced listeners to Christina's husband, Lamar, a few weeks ago. Christina is a working nurse who unexpectedly found herself in the role of caregiver for Lamar after his ALS diagnosis. Christina, thank you so much for being with us this week on Connecting ALS. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, you know, uh, listeners had an opportunity to hear from Lamar a couple weeks ago, so they probably have some familiarity, but let's just start and dig into your connection to ALS. Sure. So my husband, Lamar Woody, was diagnosed about four years ago. I am a nurse by profession, but that is not usually the particular patient population that I deal with on a regular basis. We know this is a still fairly rare disease, but sort of my professional background with patients is more post-surgical. I've done a little bit of pediatrics, things like that. But so my direct connection more so is just through my husband. Neurologists could go their entire career without diagnosing someone with ALS or or encountering that, right? It's certainly true of of other health practitioners. Your background in kind of healthcare and in medicine, did it inform how you kind of approached the diagnostic process? Did you feel like you started to have some guesses as to what might be going on? Or like, how did your background and training inform how you approached both the diagnosis and then life the last four years with ALS? Sure. Well, I guess professionally, you know, when he first started having symptoms of, you know, mostly what we saw was weakness, occasionally having seizure issues, but really just sort of that physical decline was so noticeable for him because he's always been athletic, you know, very active. And so to just see him drop a lot of weight, lose a lot of muscle mass very quickly while still engaging in what he had always done, you know, was just a crazy thing to see. But my way of sort of processing things as a nurse is always, you know, horses, not zebras, you know, so you kind of start looking at, okay, what, what do we know? What can we fix? What are sort of like the obvious signs and symptoms to address first before you start thinking of the zebra, something as rare as like ALS, that was nowhere in your radar, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I guess, you know, he is also been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And so we had kind of just started, you know, looking into so many things just related to 
sort of surface issues that we knew about, you know. But just once we saw that, you know, his symptoms were getting more complicated than that, and even his physicians were like, ah, oh, we need to take closer look at this because none of that is normal behavior or normal, you know. So um, I think professionally, I just kind of stood on the grounds of let's just work with what we know. Um, but, you know, I think as a spouse, it was pretty obvious to me, like, uh, this this could be bad. You know, I've never seen him, yeah. you know, have some of these symptoms or have this weakness or be fatigued like this. And I think so on a spouse level, I knew we were probably dealing with something bigger. Yeah. And, and of course, you get that confirmation that you were dealing with something bigger yeah. with, with the diagnosis. Um, I, I want to talk about your, your role as, as a spouse, as a caregiver. We are approaching uh, National Family Caregiver Awareness Month, mm-hmm. um, an opportunity to reflect on all the work that, that family caregivers do. So talk to me a little bit about your role as a caregiver for Lamar. Um, you know, I think we're kind of in a bigger transition of that. Like I said, being a nurse. I I mean, I work full time still. And um, so that I think in just the last few years, while he's still been able to maintain a good bit of mobility and independence, you know, we've kind of stayed that course of normal life. I'm throwing up my air quotes right now. (laughs) Um, You know, normal life, you know, whatever he could do on his own, we, you know, let him do that. And being kind of young and still in our working 30s age, you know, full-time work is just kind of necessary for us right now or for me to continue, especially yeah. since he left work. But I feel like in the just in the last month or so, we've kind of talked about that and some of the limitations that he's had and a little bit of decline that he's had recently that it might be time for me to <laughs> try to find a way to pull back, work remotely, whatever that may look like to be more of a caregiver at home for him just since his needs now are are kind of there. I mean, I think just, you know, I am appreciative that I have that background in nursing and that I've, you know, have a decade or more of experience under my belt, at least to, you know, bring that to the table. But, you know, either way, it's hard just to have be alongside as a, as a spouse and have to, you know, watch that and, you know, yeah, well, I wanted to ask about that because uh, you, you, you know, you, your background as a nurse. I think it'd be easy to sit here and think like, "Oh, you trained for this, yeah. right? You, you've got this, right?" Mm-hmm. But this is your husband, right? right. And, yeah. and so it's a different dynamic, I'm sure. That the the bedside manner is probably quite a bit different when you're talking about your spouse as opposed to a patient. Not that you don't bring a level of of care to patients, but but it's different, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. You know, sometimes I joke. Um, you know, nurses sometimes were looked at as like, we're just the overpaid waitresses. And, <laughs> you know, like, sometimes that's how people treat us. Um, in the hospital. I do not think that, but I'm <laughs> sure, I'm sure that's how you get treated. It's terrible, but I'm sure. Right. So, you know, but at home, yeah, it's, it's different. So you can kind of deal with a lot more at the hospital because yeah, you're trained for that. It's, it's not always scary in the moments, you know, even when you have critical patients, because that's your job. That's what you're trained to do. And you see it every day. But you know, at home, it's different. And I tell them all the time, you know, it's hard for me too. even though there's things I know you're going to go through. And, you know, educationally, I understand that. And I know what to expect and maybe how to manage it. But you know, it's it's still hard because you have a different level of care and compassion for this person that that is your family, that is your spouse, and you know, just hits a little bit closer. But you know, as we go through different things and he's battling different symptoms, you know, I tell him too, I'm like, I may have all the knowledge in the world of how to help you, but I don't have a CT in the back room. I don't have lab. <laughs> You know, so like there's a lot of things, even though I would know what to do, I can't do those things at home, you know, so it still presents its challenges, even having a medical background for sure. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. So you, you talked about being a spouse, being a working professional, also a working mom. Talk to me a little bit about juggling that ball. Yeah, I think, you know, we had done our interview with the ALS Association and I told him, I was like, I have like the trifecta of responsibility. 
<laughs> you know, it's like professional Absolutely. caregiver, um, home care caregiver, spouse, mom. It's all the things. So, you know, like this has just been the crazy transition for us with if ALS had never entered our life, we would be, again, with my air quotes, our normal, just 30 year old young working family. And so everybody, you know, you just think about that in America. It's like everybody's busy. Everybody's running the circus, you know, when you talk about that. And then you throw in something as complicated as ALS and it's, you know, it's a three ring circus on fire, basically. <laughs> So, you know, my daughter, she's very active. And so we try to keep life normal for her and she loves to play sports. And so, I mean, all of those things are time consuming, but I think she bears with it really well and understands that as a family, ALS brings some limitations, whether that's time or physicality, you know, and we just got to roll with it. So it's busy. It is definitely busy. And I do feel pulled in a lot of directions a lot of a lot of times but um and again that's kind of leading us to as she's getting older and more active and Lamar's limitations a little bit more now that um it's probably time to transition home as much as I can yeah and for folks listening at home you you've, you've talked about being a nurse but it's it's more than that where you're a traveling nurse right yes. so you're <laughs> going to different places right. so being home is not just being home from the hospital it's being home from a different city yeah yeah sometimes so i actually had just finished up an assignment about a month ago um in atlanta which is like 2 hours from where we live in auburn so yeah i was doing commuting on top of you know working so it was a lot. And I think just after that assignment, I was like, I do need just some mental rest for myself. So I'm going to take a little bit of time off. And again, we've just had some things lately where I'm like, eh, this may be extended time off until I figure out a new a new plan. So there's always like, what's the plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G? And we just keep going down the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You mentioned your your conversation with the ALS Association. Yeah. You and Lamar have partnered with the association to try and help raise awareness here through the end of the year. Um, talk to me a little bit about the decision to share your story and what you hope people who may not have a personal connection to ALS, what do you want them to know about this disease and the fight against it? Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about this lately just because, you know, since partnering with the ALS Association, just so many new resources and connections have come out of that. And I mean, we are just blown away and truly grateful. And it has been a fantastic experience. And, you know, we were always kind of engaged as far as social media or whatever through our Alabama chapter and things like that. But this has just really kind of opened our eyes to what the community, you know, the community of ALS that is actually out there in the world. And even surprisingly so close to where we are. And so um, that's been just incredible to get to know new people and and all of that. I think, you know, it it's just leading us to finding new resources and more so addressing it even in our life. I think the last few years, we've been blessed that Lamar hasn't had major issues up until kind of this point. <laughs> but, you know, it's almost been like ALS is this big elephant in the room that we've kind of just like, yeah, okay, it's there. We know we're going to have to deal with it. But it's almost like, again, with this idea of let's try to live as normal as possible and see what happens. <laughs> you know, it's kind of been the elephant in the room pushed in the corner. And now that you know, it's kind of come to the point where we have to pay attention a little bit more because things and the way that we balance life and the way that we balance and manage his health um, is looking a whole lot different now. It's just been like this amazing timing that as all of that is going on in our personal life, gaining these new connections and community with the ALS Association is just like this perfect blessing, you know, just that we have that and our eyes are being opened to so much more at a time in the diagnosis and the journey where we need it the most sort of thing. So that's been a, a great experience and really helped us to kind of work through it a little bit better. You know, the last four years, it's like, okay, we're just like survive, <laughs> survive the crazy and whatever happens, we'll deal with it. But now I feel like we're getting a little bit better grip on, 
you know, emotionally and mentally processing that diagnosis a little better and, you know, trying to set in motion, okay, what is our life really going to look like on a day to day and managing the, the diagnosis a little bit better. We talked a little bit about your role as a caregiver, and I, I mentioned that November is Family Caregiver Awareness Month. Um, what more do you think we could do just as a society, as a culture, to support family caregivers? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, years ago, it's interesting, I had posted like, I'm a big TED Talk person, and I love I love listening to them, and especially, you know, sciencey healthcare ones. And, you know, there was a great one, I, I can't remember the title at this point, but um, just about how, you know, caregiving really should be seen in our society, in our healthcare system in America as, you know, a full-time job that should be supported. And, you know, however that looks financially or whatever, but um, that that's important for, you know, these terminal, chronic, severe illnesses that that is eventually, you know, going to be the best thing for them to have a full-time caregiver at home and, you know, being a professional nurse, like we see that all the time. You know, I work in more so acute care settings where it's like, yeah, even as sick as you can be, the plan is that you won't be here forever. So, you know, (laughs) getting home and how your life is going to look being managed outside of the hospital doors is huge. And who's going to do that for you? You know, and um, you're not always dealing with somebody like me who has a medical background and has that knowledge where you can send that patient home, you know, with somebody who at least has some, some medical whereabouts, you know, about them. Um, so I think supporting caregiving as caregivers is so important. Um, you know, not only just for what is that specific caregiver, do they have the knowledge, they have the education, do they have the resources, um, to be able to manage this? Are they mentally prepared to do that? You know, even just something simple, like what does our house look like? (laughs) You know, we deal with that with like total knee patients. Like, well, we can't send you home if you got 30 stairs in your house. Like what's, you know, so rehab you go and then we'll figure it out. But, um, but you know, that's also ultimately going to give, we have better supporting resources um, or finances for a caregiver role, then ultimately that's going to be better for the patient, like for sure, you know, that their care is being managed properly and have the resources that they need out of their caregiver, their full-time attention and everything to be able to stay at home and help them. So you mentioned the, uh, the kind of the, the mental preparation and I know like respite care and burnout is, is another big issue that we hear about from, from caregivers, um, something that, that needs to be managed. Well, Christina, I know you're wearing many hats yeah. and juggling many balls and I can mix many more metaphors to talk <laughs> about just how little time you have and we're grateful for the time that you've, you shared with us. But before I let you go, any closing thoughts as you continue down this road of kind of sharing your story to try and help raise awareness about the fight against ALS? Oh, gosh. We've just been blown away by the community. And I think just my sort of an impression is just that there are so many good people out there, whether it's you have a direct you know, tie to somebody dealing with ALS or you're the patient and you know, that's been just so encouraging that there's such a strong community, whether you're directly affected or not, that people want to support this and they want to see, you know, ALS managed well and see people living their best life, um, even under the terrible circumstances of it. And so um, that's just very encouraging that, you know, there are people out there, even if you don't fully understand the illness, like they want to help and they want to, they want to know and learn. And so I think, just to hopefully encourage more people to want to know about it and, and just, you know, care about others that are going through it and that experience and know it's not something that you're just going to be like, how are you feeling today? You better. I think that's like the worst thing Lamar ever, ever hears. He's like, please don't ask me if I'm better. <laughs> I've heard that before. Yeah. It's, it's totally understandable. Yeah. So just, you know, to want to learn, it's something that, you know, probably people have heard about, but just maybe don't know a lot. And so, yeah, just always keep an open mind to want to learn about it and how you can support people. You can't fix it, but that doesn't mean you can't be a supportive role to a patient or a family with it. So, Well, Christina, thank you again so much for your time yeah, this week. It's been a, an absolute joy talking with you. Thank you. 
I want to thank my guest this week, Christina Woody, and the entire Woody family for sharing their story as a way to help raise support and awareness for the fight against ALS. We will share a link in the show notes to the HHS caregiver study mentioned at the top, as well as a link to the ALS focus survey data on caregivers. If you like this week's episode, share it with a friend. And while you're at it, rate and review Connecting ALS wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a great way for us to connect with more listeners. Our production partner for this series is Citizen Race Car, post-production by Alex Brower, production management by Gabriella Montekin, supervised by David Hoffman. That's going to do it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. We'll connect with you again soon. Bye.